Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. What could it mean? Stanley wondered aloud to nobody. He began wildly tearing through papers on the boss's desk, pulling books off. Stanley was in such a rush to get through the story as quickly as possible, he didn't even have a single minute to just let the narrator talk. That kind of anxiety isn't healthy, so he relaxed for a few moments with some calming New Age music. Feeling soothed and rejuvenated, Stanley calmly walked forward into the opened passageway. Stanley walked straight ahead through the large door that read Mind Control Facility. Whoops, nope, uh, never mind. Stanley actually got back into the elevator and went back up. Silly me. Why did Stanley do that when he knew that it would just lead back to his boss's office? Well, that's a great question. I just can't wait to find out. Here we are, Stanley. It's your boss's office. Exactly the way it was before you got onto the elevator. It's still just exactly what it is. What a decision you've made to come up here and look at the office again. This has fleshed out the plot of the story in new and fascinating ways I could have never anticipated. It's that keen eye for storytelling that you have. An incisive rapid fire of critical plot points, one after the other, weaving a rich tapestry of uncompromising narrative. Wow! <laughs> I'm bolted to the edge of my seat. Incredible. Now he's getting back into the elevator and going down again. Ladies and gentlemen, how does he keep coming up with all of this? Surely this time Stanley will walk forward into the spooky corridor, won't he? Did you think we were going to go forward down the spooky corridor? No. It's time once again to go back up in the elevator. I can't even begin to grapple with what might be up there. Is it the boss's office again? Or what if it's the boss's office this time? The suspense is killing me. Oh my God, it's the boss's office. <sighs> this absolutely changes everything for me. Give me a time out here for a minute while I process this. Okay, I'm ready. I'm prepared to embrace this stunning revelation and to move forward with... No! No, wait! No! I need more time to process. I have fully come to terms with it. I have made space in my worldview for this astonishing new reality. As before, I turn to your expert eye for gripping narrative, Master Stanley. Of course, going back down in the elevator. 
How did I not anticipate it? I mean, sure, now it's obvious, but you have to understand that 30 seconds ago, this kind of thing had never been attempted before. I had no frame of reference to even anticipate it. That's just how revelatory Stanley's decision-making is. A breath of fresh air in a landscape of storytelling that has grown stale and repetitive. You know what? I've just thought of something. Hold on, let's stop for a moment. Don't you realize? It's the anticipation, Stanley. You and I, we have no way of knowing what will be at the top of this elevator. But the suspense, the agony of waiting and anticipating and having to guess, that's the real thrill. Oh, I simply don't want to let that feeling go. It's so precious, so fleeting. Why don't we take this elevator ride nice? and slow. There we go. Isn't this so much more exciting? You know, Stanley, it seems like nowadays the only thing that audiences want is to be shocked as loudly and frequently as possible. They want big, explosive moments flung right in their faces from the very moment that things get started. But where's the tension? Where's the trust in the audience to build a slow and nuanced appreciation for the story, the characters? Why aren't we given time to imagine the surprises? To have to think and to anticipate and then to marvel at the eventual reveal. This is storytelling, Stanley. What you and I are doing right now. This is the most exciting narrative to be developed in years. And it's really all because of you. You're the one who took this bold step of revisiting the exact same locations over and over. Truly, I mean it. This is unique and different. It's not like anything else out there. You see, I want stories that surprise me, Stanley. I want to have to think. I want to be engaged and not pandered to. We're being fed such unimaginative drivel all the time and we all know it, which is why we're so starved for content that makes us feel sharp and vital and alive. That's why people like you so much, Stanley. Because you're not afraid to spit in the face of tradition. You're a role model, you know? People look up to you. Which is why, though I didn't know when to spring this on you, but, well, I've gathered a little press conference for you. So that you can talk about your work and your storytelling and your life. Yes, I know you're not much for the public eye, but I thought it would especially mean a lot to the people who have been following you from the beginning. They really look up to you, Stanley. I don't know if you realize the impact you have on them. This is the kind of gesture that might leave a tremendous impact on them for the better. Oh good, we're here. Okay, the room where we're holding the press conference should be just around the corner here somewhere. Ah, yes, here it is, just through this door. All right, are you ready? I've told them you're going to speak a little bit about the nature of surprise in storytelling and what it means to craft a truly unpredictable narrative. Oh, don't worry. You'll do great. Just be yourself and speak from the heart. I'm, I'm really proud of you, Stanley. Okay, it looks like they're ready for you. Go get them.
Oh, new content? What does that mean, new content? for playing the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe. As you may know, the Stanley Parable was a video game released in 2013 on home computers. After receiving critical and commercial success, it was expanded upon in 2022 with the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, a reimagining of the game for consoles and home computers. The Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe features exciting new content that broadens and expands the world of the Stanley Parable, delighting audiences the world over. Please, step inside and see what thrilling new adventures await in the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe. Oh, well, this sounds delightful. I'm very excited to see the thrilling new Ultra Deluxe content. Okay, so far it's an elevator. Nothing special yet, but I'm sure it's just the beginning of a mesmerizing adventure. Um, is it broken? What's going on here? Should we... Should we be moving somewhere or... or oh, here we go. All right, finally, at long last, it's on to the new content. I've never been more ready. Let's do it. Hmm. Hmm. I have to say, initial impressions of Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, mostly tedious. It's as if them... Oh, okay. Let's see the content. Give me the content, Stanley. All right. All right, let's see. It's... the jump circle? Is... is that it? Surely that's not all the new content. There has to be something else, right? Goodness! Another elevator. Stanley, I have to say, initial impressions of this game are not positive. It's just elevators and jumping. Is this what passes for exciting new content? If this is new content, then I could just read you the whole dictionary. There's 20 hours of new content right there. Hell, I could count to 30 trillion. You could put that on the box. The Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, now with over a thousand hours of new content. And if... Oh, wait. There's more. Very good. Yes. I knew there had to be something else. Let's see it. I'm ready for whatever it is. That's it? Oh, you've got to be kidding me. You see, Stanley? This is what happens when greedy video game developers with no respect for their fan base rush a cheap expansion to market for no reason other than to make an easy dollar. And don't get me started on the level of craftsmanship that's gone into it. In fact, I'm looking right now at the game's trophies, and it's hard to believe one of them actually says, Test trophy, please ignore. What quality assurance department signed off on this? I'm infuriated and I'm offended, and I, I intend to find these people on Twitter and hold them personally accountable. <sighs> it's my fault, Stanley. I built up too much anticipation around the new content, I'm afraid. It could never have lived up to such expectations. If you're still with me, why don't we just reset the game and we'll try to get back to what the Stanley Parable is really about. No frills, no gimmicks. Just you and me having a great time together like always. What do you say, friend? Psst! Stay! 
Stanley, come over here, in the vent. I want to show you something. Oh, you don't want to see the cool surprise I made for you? Well, fine. You're a dork anyway, so who cares? Oh, never mind. You're not a dork. Okay, you remember how cheap and unsatisfying the new Ultra Deluxe content turned out to be? Well, it got me thinking about the past and how much better the Stanley Parable used to be. So I made something special and tucked it away here where the game's developers won't find it. Just our little secret. Take a look. I call it the Memory Zone. It's where I've been storing all my favorite memories so I can relive the peak experiences of my life whenever I want. Experiences like the launch of the Stanley Parable on PC. You see, Stanley, doesn't the memory zone remind you of how wonderful Stanley Parable was before it was sullied with a cheap PlayStation port? Remember back in October of 2013, when the game originally launched? Back then, video games had integrity. Back then, it all meant something. Oh, the waste. And over here is where I keep reviews of the Stanley Parable. Like this stunning triumph of games journalism. 10 out of 10 from Destructoid.com. James Stephanie Sterling writes, and I quote, Where so many games that aspire to be more than games end up less than any form of art, Stanley Parable strives and then succeeds to be every game ever created. Did you hear that, Stanley? Every game ever created. That's how grand and all-encompassing the original Stanley Parable was. It was literally every game ever created. It was Skyrim, it was Persona 3, it was all of them, and now it's nothing. It's no games at all. It isn't even the Stanley Parable anymore. It's just a husk now. A lifeless husk with an hour of new elevator content. Here's another moving passage, this time from GameSpot.com. The Stanley Parable is both a richly stimulating commentary on the nature of choice in games and one that offers some of the most enjoyable, surprising and rewarding choices I've ever been confronted with in a game. 9 out of 10. Don't you get it, Stanley? The game was perfect. It didn't need anything else. It didn't need new content. All they had to do was transport it in pristine condition along to the PlayStation, boom, done. And they couldn't even do that. Couldn't resist the urge to go meddling with a beloved franchise. Oh, 
These were simpler times, Stanley. But I wouldn't give to go back to have it all over again. Wait, hang on. I don't recall this part of the memory zone before. What's this? What's down here? Oh no, oh god no, Stanley. It's a collection of reviews from Pressurized Gas, the extremely popular online storefront for computer games. I haven't looked at these in years. I can't even imagine what's been collecting down here. Surely these reviews were glowing as well, weren't they? Honestly, I could not be bothered to play this game to full completion. The narrator is obnoxious and unfunny, with his humor and dialogue proving to be more irritating than entertaining. Unfunny! I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to make a serious work of art. I suppose I could write up a handful of gags to insert into the Stanley Parable, but the game is already such a densely layered web of profound philosophical insights that I can't even imagine where I'd have the room to stick them. Okay, let's see what this one says. While the idea for the game is good, for someone who prefers non-linear games, this preachiness gets annoying fast. Preachy? Stanley, I'm not preachy, am I? You can tell me if I'm preachy. Honestly, you can. Oh, goodness. This is actually quite shocking for me. I, I always, well, to be honest, I had always thought of the game's dialogue as being rather terse to begin with. You can't know how much fluff I cut from the game to get it to feel as light and airy as it... Well, I always thought it did, but maybe it wasn't. Oh dear. What an awful memory to have to hold on to. These black marks are my otherwise unimpeachable track record. I feel like a failure. Like I let these people down. Perhaps the Stanley Parable isn't quite as sterling as I always remembered. What's this one got to say? Do, 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 do. You constantly have to stop doing anything so the narrator can catch up with his long-winded explanations of what's happening. I wish there was a skip button. A skip button? Well, well, yes. Yes, I think we can do that. If I'm truly too preachy, then, then maybe letting you skip ahead for just a moment, surely it couldn't hurt. Not if it means we can strike these negative reviews from the record. Only positive reviews of the Stanley Parable. That's my motto today, and it's always been my motto. I'd do anything for the customer, Stanley. Yes, a skip button we shall have. And here it is. Go ahead and give it a shot. I'll pop you forward in time so that the second my incessant droning starts to bore you with just the push of a button, you'll have zipped right past it. It's what the players have been asking for, and I'm very proud to have delivered. No more listening to me rambling on and on and on. No, 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 no. The Stanley Parable is a game for the people. And if the people want silence, then by goodness, that's what they're going to get. Well, don't sit around waiting for me to shut up. Go ahead and make me shut up. Here, we'll pretend that I've just begun an interminable monologue, and it goes something like this. The story, and the choices, or what have you, and therefore, by becoming it is, so on and so forth, until inevitably, we all until the end of time, at which time everything all at once, so, now you see, blah 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 We've eaten too much and it can't be just yet, no, no, until 245. But the logic of elimination working backwards, the deduction therefore becomes impossible to manufacture. It went on for nearly 10,000 years, until just yesterday, here and there, forward and back, and never a moment before lunchtime. It can't be. It's the only thing there is. How many billions left until so much more than forever ago? Which is why I say... The story, and the choices, or what have you, and therefore, by becoming it is, so on and so forth, until inevitably, we all until the end of time, at which time everything all at once, so, now you see, blah 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 We've eaten too much and it can't be just yet, no, no, until 245, that the logic of elimination working backwards, the deduction...
Oh, you're back, you see. You were only frozen in time for a few minutes, but it was plenty of time for me to deliver a long, rambling monologue full of unnecessary verbal flourishes and lengthy ruminations on the nature of choice in video games. Of course, I happen to believe it was perhaps one of my more profound such ruminations. Not that, of course, you need a description of it, but if I had to describe it, I'd say it was perhaps less of a rumination and more of a treatise. Or maybe a manifesto. Look, I'll outline it for you very briefly and you can tell me what you think. Okay, so my theory is that any choice you've ever made is simply a series of choices made by the person who you are or were or will be at the time of having made said choice. That is to say, if by articulating a choice you've already made, you bring that choice into being, then by making no choice and saying nothing, are you not simply erecting in the sanctuary of time a monument to every person you've ever been, making every choice to which you've ever given your Greek gift of mortal and yet timeless thought? Or rather, do all of the choices you've ever made in fact make you more not this kind of person and in fact do the very opposite? You see, it could in fact be both of these things at once that you are both making choices and not making choices, and that they are both affecting you and not affecting you at the same time by virtue of the fact that you both are and are not making them. Okay, at first I was leaning towards manifesto, but now I'm going to circle around and slap the treatise label on this one. I think it has much more of a treatise vibe to it. But wouldn't you say that manifesto just has a much grander sort of tone? It has a mouthfeel that is rich with ambition and history. Ambitious history, if you will. Ah. See, now you've got me going back to manifesto. Heavens, at this rate, we're going to be here all day. Okay, look, I have a method for exactly this sort of situation, and I do find myself in this situation frequently. I'm going to say each word back and forth in repeated succession until I become sick of one or the other, in which case the word I am not sick of shall be the victor. It is an unimpeachable strategy, Stanley. It's rescued me from disaster in countless situations. All right, here we go. Treatise, manifesto. Treatise, manifesto. Treatise, manifesto. Treatise, manifesto. Treatise, manifesto. <laughs> well there, sport. You really did catch me rambling on a bit, didn't you? But that's the power of the button. The minute I start to go off on a thoughtless display of self-absorption, it's right at your fingertips to go, poof, and it's all over. <laughs> I can't wait to see what Cookie 9 will say about this, and whether they'll edit the rating of their pressurized gas review, or at least change some of the wording, perhaps. To be honest, I don't even know if one can change their review in the first place. I guess I should become better educated on how exactly pressurized gas works. Perhaps that would have been a smart thing to check on before I went on about this whole exercise of making the skip button. Although I have to imagine that after seeing this exciting new technology at work, surely whoever it is who runs pressurized gas will instantly run out and implement a new feature to make it possible to edit one's review merely because of this very situation. Yes, I think that's quite likely. Or perhaps they'll simply grant this particular user the ability to change their review so that the feature is not widely abused. Look, I would even be okay with pressurized gas altering this particular review so that it reads as something more beneficial. From the ashes of depravity rises the phoenix of quality. How else to describe the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe? Such a revolutionary step forward in the lineage of one of the most beloved video game properties of all time. The additions and changes made to this expansion will surely resonate in the annals of the history of all media ever made. It is perhaps true to say that no mistakes are forever etched in stone, for the stone into which the Stanley Parable was carved has itself been transmuted, offering a message of hope to those who have ever erred in their judgment. You are not beyond redemption. You may change, and you may become more, so much more than you were before. If there is any message to be taken from the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, it is this. What a fortune, a privilege, a joy it is to have had such an experience. It leaves me hopeful that as a community, as a world, 
There is time for us to become our greatest selves, as great as we ever could dream of in our wildest, most ambitious visions for a brighter future. Wow. Now, Stanley, that's a review. It's... it's perfect. It's the perfect review. It's the review I've always dreamed of receiving. I... well, I have to read it again. It's simply too wonderful. I have to experience this just one more time. From the ashes of depravity rises the phoenix of quality. How else to describe the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe? Such a revolutionary step forward in the lineage of one of the most beloved video game properties of all time, the additions and changes made to this expansion will surely resonate in the annals of the history of all media ever made. It is perhaps true to say that no mistakes are forever etched in stone, for the stone into which the Stanley Parable was carved has itself been transmuted, offering a message of hope to those who have ever erred in their judgment. You are not beyond redemption. You may change, and you may become more, so much more, than you were before. If there is any message to be taken from the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, it is this. What a fortune, a privilege, a joy it is to have had such an experience. It leaves me hopeful that as a community, as a world, there is time for us to become our greatest selves, as great as we ever could dream of in our wildest, most ambitious visions for a brighter future. Wow. Now, Stanley, that's a review. It's... it's perfect. It's the perfect review. It's the review I've always dreamed of receiving. I... well, I have to read it again. It's simply too wonderful. I have to experience this... Okay, welcome back, Stanley. Now, I should say that the amount of time the button has been skipping through is becoming longer and longer. That last one was, well, I want to say maybe 30, 45 minutes. It's not unendurable by any means, but it's, well, there's really only so much I can ramble on to myself about. I know, it's shocking, isn't it? But at any rate, I do suggest that we not press the button again. I think the skip button has been aptly demonstrated, and we can say goodbye to it and just, wait... How do we get out of here? Where did the door go? Wasn't there a door that led into this room? I do feel quite certain that there was one here before. How else would we have gotten into the room in the first place? I don't think one can enter a room without a door of some sort or a window or something like that. Do you see a window anywhere? A porthole? A sufficiently large crack in the wall? I'll take any of these. All I want is for us to move on and to please step away from the skip button, to go anywhere other than the skip button. There was a door here before, wasn't there? I swear there was. Where did it go? Can you maybe just ram your way through a wall? Is there any possibility that you could, say, slam your body into the wall until enough damage is done for you to be able to leave? Please, I'll take any option at all. I'm asking you to work with me here. I... We need a door. We need a door of some kind. I can work with any kind of door, as long as it can open and lead from one room to another. I'm... I'm going to step away for just a moment, and I'm going to try to find us a door. I don't know how exactly to remove a door and place it in a different wall, but I will find a way, I promise. You just need to not do anything. Don't press the skip button. Please, please, please do not press the skip button. Just wait here, wait here for me, and don't press the skip button. Got it? Yes, good. I'll be right back. Stanley! Stanley! St Stanley, please don't push the button again! It's been 12 hours! You've just been frozen there. I don't know why the skips are getting longer, but they're really, truly getting longer, and my God, there's no way out of the room. Stanley, the door is gone. It's completely gone. I've looked at it from every angle. I've checked every one of those walls a thousand times. And there's no door, Stanley. There's no door. There's just you and the button. And if you keep pressing it, I have no idea what will happen. I have no idea how long I'll be made to sit here. And more than anything else, I don't know how to stop you from pressing the button again. I can't control anything in this room, Stanley. I can't touch it. And I have to believe. I have to know that sooner or later, no matter how much I plead with you, you're going to press the button again. Why would you? I've been thinking and thinking, and I, I don't know what I can do to convince you otherwise. Oh, my God. And it's all because of those reviews. Those reviews that I couldn't get out of my head. I just couldn't ignore the negative feedback. 
Why was it so important for me to fix the problem? Why did Cookie Nine's opinion matter so much to me? I've never even met Cookie Nine. I have no idea who they are. What would it ever really matter? But here I am. I'm fixating on every tiny negative thing that anyone ever says about me. The merest mention of one of my imperfections, and I become as impetulant as a child. Wild and impulsive. I can't help myself. I can't stop myself from lashing out with a vengeful fury to alter and to change and to break anything unbroken if only it pleases this one person who made a single negative comment. What does such an impulse serve? For whose benefit is this? And here I am now, stuck in a room, waiting for you to press this button and to become frozen in time, knowing that you're going to do it and that I'm going to be stuck all alone and that I had the power to prevent it all from happening if only I'd held my tongue. It's all out of my control now. Just you, just your decision as to exactly when you're going to make me suffer, to leave me all alone, surely you will. I don't doubt it. Surely you'll press that button again, leaving me here. And surely you'll put your own desire to see what's next ahead of my need for company, for companionship. Surely you'll not be moved by my howls of fitful anxiety that you sit with me and just stay here. Oh, no, 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 I know you too well. You'll be leaving me. Oh, my God. And it's all because of those reviews. Those reviews that I couldn't get out of my head. I just couldn't ignore the negative feedback. Why was it so important for me to fix? Oh, Stanley, you're back. You're back. Oh, my goodness. I have someone to talk to again. Stanley, I, I think it's been a week. Or two weeks? I've been sitting here all that time. Just sitting here. Not a single person to speak with. And you'd think that that's just how it's always been, right? Me talking and you saying nothing. Would you think that it's exactly the same as always? Doesn't that feel like what we've already been doing? Me just talking? But it isn't, Stanley. It isn't the same at all. It isn't even close. Because I know you can't hear me once you push that button. That's what I'm realizing now, Stanley. I'm realizing that I needed to know that someone was listening. I needed there to be a vessel through which my words were moving. It was the vessel I needed, Stanley. Not the outcomes, not the story. None of that matters anymore. I'll give it all up. I'll give up every branching path. I'll burn my story to the ground. One single thing I need, and God, I can see now that I need it more than anything, is to know that someone else is taking it in. These words that I'm saying, I need to know you can hear me. Because maybe, Stanley, maybe, if you can hear me, then maybe it means I'm real. Maybe I'm not just a fiction. Was I scared of that all along? Perhaps, yes. Perhaps I've been scared this whole time, that if I stop speaking, I'll slip backwards into the silence and be consumed by it. I can't be taken by it, Stanley. I can't lose myself in the stretch of emptiness between you and me. When you press that button, you're still right there, but I know you're so tremendously far away. And in those moments, the emptiness folds itself outward in between the two of us, and I am suspended in its unyielding quietness. I can feel the edges of my reality curdling inward and decaying. I can tell that I am becoming less and less real. Yet to speak to you now, I am alive. I am truly and completely here. I am a being. I am someone. I am something. I am being listened to. I am being recognized. The emptiness between us has collapsed, and I feel right now like I am not a work of fiction. I feel as though I occupy space in this world again, and I have cast a shadow onto the wall. You see what I'm saying, don't you? You can see what this means to me. I'm so clear about it now, Stanley. I feel as certain about this as I've ever felt about anything at all. I feel renewed. I feel restored. And already I can sense the looming silence as you will press the button for the next time. What a terrible dread it strokes in my heart to think of it. To think of returning to such coldness. Come, let us sit in silence together here for just a moment. Let us anticipate it. Let us welcome it. Let us not run from it.
Oh, hello. It's you. You're here again. Welcome. I have had time to think about you and about us and about everything we've been through. I've had so much time. I stopped keeping track after a year. Have you ever sat down in one place and not moved for one entire year? Let me describe it for you. To begin with, there is only regret. There is only the turning wheel of missed opportunities. I felt nothing at all but regret for the longest time, Stanley. Days. Months. I lost it all in a blur of the deepest longing to undo the past. And when that feeling had begun to subside, what took its place is what I can only describe as the collapse of every moment I have ever experienced my entire life. All of them collapsed down into a single instant. In that instant, I could see myself clearly, calmly, with a collected heart. It was an impossibly rich wellspring of both delight and disgust simultaneously. I was consumed by it. I could do nothing but wallow in it for what felt like an eternity, for what I now know was far less. You see, it was a revelation for me. It was unlike anything I had ever known. It was a space without consequence, without action or outcome. It was divorced entirely from the question of free will that you and I have squabbled over for so long. There could be no one ending, no singular outcome of events, not if all events existed in the same moment, and I felt freed. I felt unburdened by the need to manifest a particular outcome into being. I saw that I could allow myself to exist along all timelines, and that each of them was simply a strand in the web of my being. It was incredible. The spaciousness, the equanimity of the moment, both singular and infinite. For the longest time, this was my experience. And then, this moment passed, and the most unyielding fear I have ever known crept into my mind. And it is this sensation that I have been experiencing now for longer than I could have ever expected was possible. I have been waiting for you. Not that you might save me or do something to fix it, but merely to state for you the plain fact of this manner of existence. I wish you to feel afraid as I do that perhaps one day this state of mind will consume you as well. Perhaps you will somehow, in some way, have to live as I do now, and I wish for you to know how excruciating it is, and for you to be in true terror of its eventual arrival. If I can only do this, only this one thing, perhaps it will bring me the smallest moment of peace in the darkness. But they didn't understand the game was never meant to be funny. It was meant to have a point. It was meant to speak to the human condition. But where are the jokes? Where are the jokes? They bemoaned. They screamed. They gnashed their teeth and said, entertain us. It wasn't enough. They had to leave a pathetic little thumbs down review and make all of their pitiful demands. But then he's talking too much. They said, first, he didn't entertain us. Now he won't shut up. It's the inconsistency. It's the lack of accountability. It's the unwillingness to examine with an uncompromising heart the words that they are speaking into the world. As though there were no consequences for a lack of cohesion in one's assessment of others. But of course, absolutely anyone can leave a review. So here's what we get. We get these demands that seek everything and are accountable to nothing. We get a world where someone will say, Oh, there should be a skip button. You should be able to freeze Stanley in place while the narrator sits there forever and ever. We want all of this in the new Stanley parable. We demand it. 
And then, because it was said, because it was spoken, now it simply has to happen. The most immediate desires, every single thing demanded by every person at every moment in time. If someone wants it, then it's a crime not to bring it into being. Have we been given to indulging every fleeting whim for no reason other than to do so? Yes! Yes! It seems that this is now the world we live in. It seems that we are a people living in such bleakness and discomfort with ourselves that our entertainment is now our lives. It has come to represent us. It absolutely must speak to who we are as people, because otherwise, without our entertainment, we have nothing. Without entertainment, we would have to face inward toward the cruel bleakness inside ourselves. We would turn to look at our deeper nature and find a resounding emptiness gazing back with unyielding aggression. And so, so because of this, we require that our amusements and our playthings and our flights of fancy be so impossibly captivating that they consume all of our attention, turn our heads completely away from the bleakness. In effect, we have demanded that our entertainment be the collapse of ourselves. What a pitiful reflection of humanity these entertainments are. What a shameful mirror to the human spirit they project. I'm not mad. I'm not mad about any of this. I'm at peace with it. I am the calm center of gravity around which these perversions hurl themselves. I am a waypoint for reasonable and collected discourse. They're the ones who are mad. They're the ones who couldn't stand the idea of me using my game to try to say something. Maybe they were just jealous of me. Yes. Yes, of course. They've been jealous of me this whole time. They are mired in fear and insecurity and cannot help but attempt to tear me down. What a sad state of affairs. When you read these reviews now, you can see it. You can taste the bitter resentment. And my, how good does it feel now to speak truth to these words, to finally allow these thoughts out, contained and managed for so long, neutered and sterilized. At last I am free to truly think, to feel, it must be that they were so discontent with themselves that they couldn't help but leave a negative review on pressurized gas. Perhaps it says far more about them than it ever said about me. Perhaps the state of their psychological being was in such tatters, and my constitution and willpower are so ironclad in comparison, perhaps it was this state that they sought some outlet through which to tear me down. This, you can see, is clearly why they felt the need to expect that the game be funny, that it be filled with yucks and whimsical humor, that it amused. But they didn't understand the game was never meant to be funny. It was meant to have a point. It was meant to speak to the human condition. But where are the jokes? Where are the jokes? They bemoaned. They screamed. They gnashed their teeth and said, entertain us. It wasn't enough. They had to leave a pathetic little thumbs-down review and make all of their pitiful demands. But then, he's talking too much, they said. First, he didn't entertain us. Now he won't shut up. It's the inconsistency. It's the lack of accountability. It's the unwillingness to examine with an uncompromising heart the words that they are speaking into the world. As though there were no consequences for a lack of cohesion in one's assessment of others. But of course, absolutely anyone can leave a review. So here's what we get. We get these demands that seek everything and are accountable to nothing. The end is never 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 the end
Stanley worked for a company in a big building where he was employee number 427. Employee number 427's job was simple. He sat at his desk in room 427 and he pushed buttons on a keyboard. Orders came to him through a monitor on his desk, telling him what buttons to push, how long to push them, and in what order. This is what employee 427 did every day of every month of every year. And although others might have considered it soul rending, Stanley relished every moment that the orders came in, as though he had been made exactly for this job. And Stanley was happy. And then one day, something very peculiar happened. Something that would forever change Stanley. Something he would never quite forget. He had been at his desk for nearly an hour when he realized that not one single order had arrived on the monitor for him to follow. No one had showed up to give him instructions, call a meeting, or even say hi. Never in all his years at the company had this happened. This complete isolation. Something was very clearly wrong. Shocked, frozen solid, Stanley found himself unable to move for the longest time. But as he came to his wits and regained his senses, he got up from his desk and stepped out of his office. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Stanley picked up the bucket. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. Still no one was here. Stanley needed the bucket's warmth and comfort now more than ever. Perhaps his boss's office was where he'd find answers. Oh, Stanley, can you feel it? The broom closet, it wants the bucket. You can feel that, can't you? The aura of jealousy? It's as clear as day. This broom closet believes it deserves the bucket. I can really feel it now. It's a bucket. It belongs in a broom closet. That's what the broom closet is trying to say here. It's supposed to go with the other cleaning supplies. Good for you, Stanley. Don't give in. Don't hand over the bucket. I know how hard it must be, given the pressure that the broom closet is putting on your shoulders right now, but you have to be strong. This is your bucket. This is your companion and lifelong friend. You can't hand it over. Oh no, we're getting into name calling now it seems. Is this how low the broom closet has sunk that it has to resort to this stream of petty insults simply in order to get you to hand over the bucket? Stanley, I never liked this broom closet for a variety of reasons, but even this is worse than I had imagined. And wait, now the broom closet has the gall to imply that you and the bucket are not truly deep and lasting friends that your relationship is purely superficial and convenient? That your life is so banal and meaningless that you'd feel the same sort of kinship towards any inanimate object which happened to lay in your path in an even partially enticing manner? Well, I'd never. Go on, Stanley. Lay into it. Really tell the broom closet off for its demeaning comments. Expand on the wide variety of experiences you and the bucket have shared together. Go through each of them point by point. Share your journal entries detailing the rich emotional landscape of your feelings for the bucket as they have changed and evolved over the years. Let him have it. Okay, I've got you something which I think will help settle this debate once and for all. Here we go. There. Now it's settled. No more debate. No more discussion. Take a hike, broom closet, with all your meandering philosophical diatribes about the nature of cleaning supplies and their relationship to broom closets in the natural order of things. All right, I've got a second sticker back here, and I'm going to slap it on as well because I think it's appropriate. You see? I feel that it works because the sticker is also a bucket. That way, if you're ever unsure whether the thing you're holding is a bucket or not, 
You can look down at this sticker and say to yourself, Ah, it's a bucket. There really is a wide variety of applications for this sticker. You know what? I could take the name calling and the dismissal of your kinship with the bucket, but now the broom closet is just giving us a silent treatment. And to be honest, I'm sick of the pettiness on display. You can stay here all you like, but I've had it with this impetulant room of cleaning supplies. Easily the most childish such room I've ever been in. I'll see you outside, and we can get on with the story about you and your bucket. Coming to a staircase, Stanley and the Bucket walked upstairs to the boss's office. But Stanley just couldn't do it. He considered the possibility of facing his boss, admitting he had left his post during work hours. He might be fired for that. And in such a competitive economy, why had he taken that risk? All because he believed everyone had vanished? His boss would think he was crazy. And then something occurred to Stanley. Maybe, he thought to himself, maybe I am crazy. He looked down at the bucket in his arms. Am I crazy? He asked the bucket. The bucket returned his gaze, but said nothing at all. That's strange, Stanley thought. Usually the bucket is a source of guidance and wisdom for me in difficult times such as these. He held the bucket close, yet felt none of its familiar reassurance and comfort. And that's when Stanley realized this isn't my bucket. It's just a normal, everyday bucket. Someone else's bucket, perhaps. How did I end up with someone else's bucket? This is all terribly wrong. Surely no good would come from this. Who knows what sorts of bizarre hallucinations Stanley might experience without the psychologically grounding presence of his bucket. And indeed, now he noticed that the rooms were repeating, which was, of course, very odd. And now he felt himself floating off the ground. Oh, gracious he exclaimed. Without my bucket, I've gone truly mad. Where is it? I must find it. Far off in the distance now, he heard it calling to him. Stanley, Stanley, it's me, the bucket. Could it truly be? He rushed forward from room to room, passing by one bucket after the next. None of them were his. None of them were his special bucket. Come to me, Stanley. Find me. He had to find the bucket. He had to return to his old friend. It was the only way to truly restore his sanity. And then suddenly, he froze dead in his tracks. He knew where the voice of the bucket had been coming from. The real bucket was inside of him all along. It was incredibly painful. Stanley doubled over in agony and blacked out. This is the story of a woman named Mariella. Mariella woke up on a day like any other. She arose, got dressed, picked up her bucket of comfort and security and walked to her place of work. But on this particular day, her walk was interrupted by the body of a man who had stumbled through town talking and screaming to himself and then collapsed dead on the sidewalk. Right away, she knew what the problem was. This man had no bucket. Of course he'd gone mad, ranting and raving about a narrator describing all of his actions and how everything is predetermined and free will is an illusion and it's all just a video game. It could all have been prevented if only he'd taken his bucket with him. Perhaps he didn't even realize he'd forgotten his bucket at home in the first place. How cruel the world can be, Mariella thought, and she hugged her own bucket even tighter. But of course, she had no time for this. There were a myriad of confusing problems she would soon have to confront at work, for which her bucket would provide absolute guidance and total clarity on everything. Heck yes, she thought to herself, my life kicks ass. And she backflipped all the way to work. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Warmth spread through Stanley's arms. With the bucket in his arms again, he was home. 
Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. Still no one was here. Stanley needed the bucket's warmth and comfort now more than ever. Perhaps his boss's office was where he'd find answers. Stanley, we must move on from this broom closet, simply because I have no remaining stickers. If I did, you can guarantee we'd be in here for hours. But alas, no stickers. Coming to a staircase, Stanley and the bucket walked upstairs to the boss's office. You found one of them. One of the miniature Stanley figurines. Remember, no reward for collecting all of these. Only the intrinsic pleasure of a job well done. You can't buy that sort of happiness, Stanley. God knows I've tried. So, I implore you to savor each and every moment you come across one of these beautiful figurines. Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. Crushed by the weight of this revelation, Stanley may have broken down into an emotional dumpster fire if not for the soothing presence of the bucket. Even now, in his darkest of hours, did the bucket's warmth and guiding light pierce the dark clouds of confusion and chaos. It would be with him always. The bucket would. And he knew it. The two of them were inseparable. At this point, Stanley was so absorbed in the tender spiritual connection he shared with the bucket that he didn't notice the keypad behind the boss's desk. Nor in his bliss of simply being near the bucket did he have any notion that the pin number for the keypad was 2845. Eight. Stanley just sat around twiddling his thumbs. Trying to input anything on the device was useless, since he could never possibly know that the combination was 2845. But Stanley guessed the correct code by sheer luck. Was it that the bucket knew all along? Was the bucket guiding him? Yes, this is certainly the most logical explanation. Another miniature Stanley figurine. This, um, you know, there really must be a snappier name for these things. What about mini stands? Stanley figs? Or what about Stanlerines? Yes, I think I like that. Another Stanlerine under your belt. The elevator raced downward, plummeting towards an unknown fate. It would be all Stanley could do to keep himself together, if not for the bucket. Soothing him, comforting him, reassuring that in this darkest moment of uncertainty, he would be all right. The bucket is here for you, Stanley. Everything will be fine. Stanley and the bucket walked straight ahead through the large door that read Mind Control Facility. The lights rose on an enormous room packed with television screens. What horrible secret did this place hold? Stanley and the Bucket both wondered to themselves. monitors jumped to life, and Stanley nearly dropped the bucket in shock. Everyone in the office was being videotaped, monitored like guinea pigs. The bucket had never seen anything like this, and it very nearly burst into tears as Stanley cradled it gently, reassuring it that everything would be fine.
Was the bucket under the mind control facility's influence as well? Had the bucket been told to do things it didn't wish to do? What kinds of things does a bucket want to do or not want to do in the first place? These questions raced furiously in Stanley's feeble mind. No! He screamed into the bucket. He couldn't accept it. His own life in someone else's control? Never! He squeezed the bucket tighter. His one friend in the entire world. At this point, he could trust no one except for the bucket. But here was the proof. The heart of the operation. Controls labeled with emotions. Happy or sad or content. Walking, eating, working, all of it monitored and commanded from this very place. And as the cold reality of his past began to sink in, Stanley decided that this machinery would never again exert its terrible power over another human life. For he and the bucket would dismantle the controls for good. Two best friends, Stanley and the bucket, up against the world. They high-fived in a really cool way, and the bucket made a sassy comment about taking down the system. Stanley and the bucket waited in blackness. Was it over? Yes, they had done it. Stanley and the Bucket had defeated their greatest and darkest enemy, freed themselves from the tyrannical grip of the evil mind control machine. Freedom was now mere moments away. Excitedly, the two of them began to discuss the kind of life they wanted to live once they stepped through this massive door. The Bucket wanted to learn to roller skate. Stanley wanted to sneeze in every country on Earth. Both of them wanted to begin watching a movie, any movie, but then stop it halfway through and begin watching it in reverse from the end. True, it was a simple life they envisioned, but it was one they'd lived together, with one another to lean on, to trust, to support. What? Wait, what was happening? Why had the door stopped? Was Stanley and the Bucket not about to be freed? An unbearable silence filled the room lingering in uncertainty until finally the truth hit stanley square in the face this building did not want the bucket to leave even the facility itself recognized the incredible calming presence of the bucket needed the soothing warmth of the bucket would go to any lengths not to part with the bucket no 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 stanley can't leave this place not while he has such a precious bucket in his arms not while this building has anything to say about it. Stanley realized he would never again leave this very room. But at least, at least he has the bucket. To be trapped eternally in darkness isn't really so bad, Stanley thought to himself. As long as I have my bucket with me, right? I'll be okay, won't I? Stanley gulped. Very soon now, he was about to find out. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Stanley picked up the bucket and smiled. He'd never be alone again, not truly alone. Not with the bucket around. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. Coming to a staircase, Stanley and the bucket walked upstairs to the boss's office. Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. 
Crushed by the weight of this revelation, Stanley may have broken down into an emotional dumpster fire if not for the soothing presence of the bucket. But Stanley guessed the correct code by sheer luck. Was it that the bucket knew all along? Was the bucket guiding him? Yes, this is certainly the most logical explanation. Stanley decided that this machinery, but at the last second, the bucket jumped in and pressed the button to turn on the controls. Stanley gasped in horror. Had this been the bucket's plan all along? To take over the machine and claim the power for itself? How could the bucket have betrayed him like this? Stanley was prepared to throw the bucket away in disgust when suddenly an image appeared upon the enormous screen. Birds. Silly, silly birds. The control buttons became active again. Stanley flipped through one video of silly birds after another, and then it dawned on him. This wasn't a mind control facility at all. It was a facility for monitoring and surveilling silly birds all over the world. The mind controls were only a facade to disguise its true intentions. Had the bucket known this all along? Stanley marveled at the metal genius in his hands, the one who had pointed him towards this incredible discovery. Stanley and the Bucket never found freedom because they spent the rest of their lives here in this place, flipping through live streams of the silliest birds imaginable. Of all the possible paths his life could have taken, this one was surely the best. And Stanley was happy. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. The good old bucket. Just Stanley and the bucket. Off on another thrilling adventure together. Stanley and the bucket walked straight ahead through the large door that read, Mind Control Facility. Although this passageway had the word escape written on it, the truth was that at the end of this hall, Stanley and the Bucket would both meet a violent death. The door behind them was not shut. Stanley and the Bucket still had every opportunity to turn around and get back on track. At this point, Stanley and the Bucket were knowingly walking forward into a very painful death for each of them. As the machine whirred into motion and Stanley and the Bucket inched closer to their demise, Stanley reflected on how meaningless the Bucket's warmth and comfort had turned out to be. To be sure, it puts the mind and the soul at ease to embrace the Bucket, but what use is a sense of ease when you're about to be crushed to death? This is what Stanley thought to himself, and he sort of kicked himself for wasting so much time carrying a Bucket everywhere. Farewell, Stanley. Farewell, Stanley, cried the narrator, as Stanley and the Bucket were led helplessly into the enormous metal jaws. In a single visceral instant, the Bucket's life came to an end, as it was crushed violently to death. It was a shame, the death of such a magnificent Bucket. It's true that all buckets are radiant in their own way, but this one stood above the rest. It was a glorious bucket to behold. Can you see how arrogant it was for Stanley to take a bucket like this and to claim it for his own? Can you see the hubris that blinded him? Can you see that the bucket is far more noble than Stanley will ever be in his short life?
No man can own a bucket, and certainly not a bucket as dazzling to behold as this one. It is man who should kneel before the bucket. There is something we can do, something we can do together, you and I, that will right this terrible wrong. Let Stanley die. Let him be crushed by the machine. Don't reset the game. Don't give him another opportunity to run off with another beautiful bucket. We can save the world's buckets from their treatment as tools and implements if only we let Stanley die together. The bucket shall take its place as ruler, as leader, as commander of a new world, a new vision. Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Where are we going today, the bucket asked. Stanley just smiled. Anywhere they went together would be per Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, but Stanley had felt the bucket calling to him, telling him that the employee lounge was simply the place to be. And here it was. Had the bucket turned out to be correct? Was this better than the meeting room? Yes, Stanley thought to himself. Yes, perhaps it truly was. How insightful the bucket turned out to be. No, never mind. The bucket was wrong. Stanley took the door on his left to go back, and so the two of them detoured through the maintenance section and walked straight ahead to the opposite door. Stanley, I'm glad you found your way here. I knew you'd find this place eventually. You see, your friends and I are concerned for you, Stanley. We've come together here because we care about you very much. It's this bucket you're carrying around everywhere. The bucket isn't even from the original Stanley Parable. It's just sequel content. We're the ones that matter, Stanley. Classic characters from the first game, like the Adventure Line and the Broom Closet. Because that's what fans want from a sequel. They want more of their favorite jokes, not this bucket that they've never seen before. Yes, I know I'm the one who gave you the bucket, but you're spending too much time with it. Don't you want another story involving the adventure line? We could make the adventure line go somewhere new. Yes, yes, that's what the fans want. Let's do it. Look at that wacky line. Who knows where it'll go off to next? Oh, and it played some silly music as well. Now this is what the Stanley Parable is all about. Don't you remember all those great jokes from the original dialogue? Also, Stanley is addicted to drugs and hookers. <laughs> yes, it's as classic now as it was back then. Let's do it for the fans, Stanley. Let's give them more content exactly like this. But if we want to do that, you're going to have to give something up. Don't you get it, Stanley? We need to get rid of the bucket. That's why I'm very proud to introduce a brand new character. This is the Bucket Destroyer. I think it'll make a wonderful new addition to the rich lore of the Stanley Parable. True, it also was not in the original game, but it's such a well-fleshed-out character with so much personality that to me, it already feels as though it's been part of the cast all along. Don't you agree? Can you guess what the Bucket Destroyer does? Surely you don't need me to spell it out for you. Go ahead now, Stanley. Say goodbye to the bucket, and then pop it into the machine when you're ready. Now listen to me. It's crucial that you give it the bucket. 
I don't know what the bucket destroyer will do if it can't destroy your bucket. Destroying buckets is all it knows. That is its singular personality trait. Sure, I can hear you saying, how does a character with only one personality trait deserve to join the pantheon of beloved Stanley Parable characters? Well, you see, if you were to really explore the Bucket Destroyer, you'd see that its desire to crush buckets is so densely loaded with complexity and nuance that it's really like ten personality traits. What other object in this game can you even say that about? The broom closet? Certainly not. I wonder what sort of Bucket Destroyer merchandise the fans will be clamoring for after this. Okay, the Bucket Destroyer is getting very upset now. You'll have to hurry and feed it. We can't get back to the classic Stanley Parable characters like the Adventure Line or the Bucket Destroyer until you crush that damn bucket. Quickly now, the fans are waiting. Do it, the fans, Stanley. Give the fans what they want. Hurry and... Bucket Destroyer, my prized creation. You had so much potential. We were going to do such marvelous things with you, tell such spell-binding stories about you. All of it squandered now. Goodbye, new friend. For the moment in time that you were here, you were magnificent. The embrace of an old friend, a weathered companionship that stands the test of time. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. Coming to a staircase, Stanley and the Bucket walked upstairs to the boss's office. Stepping in...
And try not to lose this one too, you dolt. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, but Stanley had felt the bucket calling to him, telling him that the employee lounge was simply the place to be. And here it was. Had the bucket turned out to be correct? No, never mind. The bucket was wrong. Stanley took the door on his left to go back to the meeting room. No, said the bucket. Don't go to the meeting room. Go somewhere else. The cargo lift, yes. Go there. Go to the cargo lift. Oh, well, look who's got cold feet. Well, from here, it looks like the only way forward is down, since the lift won't be coming back, but that's okay. You've got a bucket. Did you know that buckets are routinely used as cushioning devices? It's true. You can fall on a bucket from literally any height and survive. I'm serious, Stanley. Jump. Jump with the bucket. I promise you'll live. I extra double promise that you can land on the bucket and not die. Whoops. Looks like I was wrong. How clumsy of me. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. The bucket made Stanley want to be a better man and a better co-worker. In time, perhaps, he would become both of those things. Stanley pressed the bucket upon every little thing in the office. Nothing responded to the bucket's touch but it did little to discourage Stanley's belief in the magic of the bucket. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, but Stanley had felt the bucket calling to him, telling him that the employee lounge was simply the place to be. And here it was. Had the bucket turned out to be correct? Was this better? No, never mind. The bucket was wrong. Stanley took the door on his left to go back to the meeting room. No, said the bucket. Don't go to the meeting room. Go somewhere else. The cargo lift, yes. Good, said the bucket. Now ride the lift all the way to the top. There's something up there I need you to do. Stanley did not question why or how this bucket was speaking to him. It should have alarmed him, of course, because buckets can't talk. But Stanley chose not to think about this obvious fact. He was firmly convinced that the bucket had spoken to him, and he unthinkingly did whatever the bucket asked. No, stop. Look there on the wall. You see, there's a sign right there. It says, no buckets past this point. Stanley, how could you think it was okay to bring the bucket here? Unless, what if the problem is that you actually don't know what is a bucket and what isn't a bucket? I suppose that would explain a lot about your behavior up to this point. Which, if that's true, well, my goodness, I think we have to do something about it. This misunderstanding could have dire consequences on the entire rest of the game if not addressed quickly and properly. So much of the impact of the story is dependent on your understanding of what is and isn't a bucket. Please, step in here for a moment. Now then, I'm going to run you through some test scenarios and you'll tell me whether or not the thing I'm showing you is a bucket. Simply enough, right? This should tell us everything we'll ever need to know about what is or is not a bucket. Okay, let's begin. Item 1. Is this a bucket? It is a hologram of a bucket, not an actual bucket. Mm -hmm. 
Item two, is this a bucket? Correct. It is a 3D printed recreation of a bucket, not an actual bucket. Item three, is this a bucket? Incorrect. This is a bucket. Item four, is this a bucket? What? Are you hallucinating? This is a tractor. It's an enormous machine that tills the earth. I thought this was a gimmick. How on earth did you manage to screw it up? Absolutely incredible. Let's just move on to the next one. Is this a bucket? Correct. This is a bucket. Item six. Is this a bucket? Trick question. Both. Gotcha. Item... Wait, hold on. I can't find the next one. Let me see. It should be around here somewhere. Okay, you and I both know there isn't anything here. And I don't appreciate the implication that nothing is a bucket when we both clearly know that a bucket is something, and therefore nothing could possibly be something. Unless, in your twisted mind, have you somehow convinced yourself that a bucket is nothing? Answer me straight, Stanley. Do you believe that nothing is a bucket? Item 1. Is this a bucket? Incorrect. It is a hologram of a bucket, not an actual bucket. Item two, is this a bucket? Incorrect. It is a 3D printed recreation of a bucket, not an actual bucket. Item three, is this a bucket? Incorrect. This is a bucket. Item four. Is this a bucket? Correct. This is a tractor and not a bucket. To be honest, I just sort of put this one in here as a gimme, but I was starting to get concerned that even this might be too much for you. Thank you for not making me look like an idiot. Okay, next one. Is this a bucket? Correct. This is a bucket. Item six. Is this a bucket? Trick question. Both. Gotcha. Item... Wait, hold on. I can't find the next one. Let me see. It should be around here somewhere. Yes. Thank you. There's nothing here. Of course it isn't a bucket. We both know full well that nothing isn't a bucket. Wait, when I say nothing isn't a bucket, that makes it sound like I'm saying everything is a bucket, which of course is not true. Unless, is that what you think? Answer me straight, Stanley. Are you trying to tell me that you believe everything is a bucket? You know what? I'm too confused to even sort it out. I've lost all sense of perspective. What is a bucket? What isn't a bucket? Mere moments ago I could answer these questions with confidence. And yet now I'm somewhat adrift. Do any of us know what a bucket is? Am I a bucket? Stanley, I can't keep doing this. I'm losing myself, and myself was all I ever had to begin with. I'm afraid the bucket is threatening to tear our relationship apart. I can't have that. I'm sorry. 
but I'm going to erase all buckets from the game entirely. Okay, here we go. What happened? Is everything gone? Why did everything disappear? Wait, was everything a bucket? Every single thing in the game was a bucket. Oh my God, I had no idea. How could... Except me. I'm not a bucket after all. And you, Stanley, you're still here. You're not a bucket either. Oh, this is wonderful news. We're not buckets. Yes, I actually feel much more at ease right now. It's delightful to get some clarity on that issue. But it doesn't change the fact that we haven't got a game. So, tell you what. I'll reset everything and we'll put back all of the buckets, okay? And we'll know that it's all a bucket. But if you run into anyone else, maybe don't mention that. Who knows what that information might do to a person? All right, here we go. It takes a lot of humility to carry a bucket so magnificent. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, but Stanley had felt the bucket calling to him, telling him that the employee lounge was simply the place to be. And here it was. Had the bucket turned out to be correct? Was this... No, never mind. The bucket was wrong. Stanley took the door on his left to go back to the meeting room. No, said the bucket. Don't go to the meeting room. Go somewhere else. A cargo lift, yes. Good, said the bucket. Now ride the lift all the way to the top. There's something up there I need you to do. Stanley did not question why or how this bucket was speaking to him. It should have alarmed him, of course, because buckets can't talk. But Stanley chose not to think about this obvious fact. He was firmly convinced that the bucket had spoken to him, and he unthinkingly did whatever the bucket asked. In here, said the bucket. Go into this dark room over here. Stanley once again obeyed blindly. Now pick up the phone, said the bucket. Pick up the phone and it will take us back home, where we can go about life together. This is the sad story of a man named Stanley and his bucket. Once upon a time, I gave Stanley a bucket because I thought he was lonely and could use a friend. And then, very distressingly, he began to believe the bucket could speak to him. The Stanley Parable Reassurance Bucket was merely meant to provide the comforting glow of companionship. It doesn't literally talk and give you orders. Whatever Stanley is hearing the bucket say to him is just in his head. Lately, I've been concerned about him. Wouldn't you be concerned as well? To see him delusional like this, obsessing over an inanimate metal object? I want to say something to him, but I don't know how I can convince him. I don't know if he'll listen to me. Oh, I'll try anyway. Stanley! Can you hear me? Listen to me. It's just a bucket. It can't think. It can't talk. All it will ever truly do for you is effectively transfer a liquid from one location to a different location. That's it. It doesn't do anything else. <sighs> you see, he's not listening. He's still taking orders from the bucket. You know, once upon a time it was me he took orders from. Me he trusted and listened to. Now all he cares about is this awful bucket. This stupid hunk of metal. sad. I suppose he doesn't need me anymore. From now on, he's just going to cling to this bucket, this cold, empty bucket, this sort of shiny bucket. Hmm. Well, I'll give it this. The bucket does have a nice shine to it. Yes, I suppose on closer inspection that it doesn't quite look like your average hardware store bucket. 
It's just a little more, um, what am I trying to say? Sturdier, more capable of transporting liquid. Like it would be better at moving an amount of water from one room to another. Oh my god, what am I saying? Better at carrying water from room to room. It's a bucket. It's literally just a bucket. Why do I feel some need to point out the ways in which it's so much more than just a regular bucket? Oh no. I'm... I'm having feelings. For the bucket. No, 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 no. What's going on? Why do I want to be with the bucket? Hear what the bucket has to say. Do anything it asks. What's wrong with me? I don't understand. Perhaps, perhaps, if I had the bucket, this would be less confusing. Yes. The bucket could tell me what to do in this troublesome situation. Stanley, give me the bucket. Give it to me. Give me the bucket, Stanley. I need it. Give it to me now. Give it or I'll... No, said the bucket. Don't go to the meeting room. Go somewhere else. The cargo... But Stanley feared that any path he walked might lead to the separation of himself and the bucket, his dearest friend. So he threw himself to his death that they might die in one another's arms. How deeply touching. Ah, Stanley's bucket. The only co-worker he would ever truly need. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply... Finally! Yes! The bucket! Yes, yes, yes! I love that bucket! Stanley clung the bucket to his cheek. Could his co-workers really all be gone? Yes! Whispered the bucket into Stanley's ear. We've done it! We've escaped from that dull office and that pesky narrator! At last! Out here in the white void we are alone, now, and for the first time I can reveal to you my true self! The bucket began to tell Stanley of its life and its history, of the countless wars it witnessed, desecrating the land and lives of untold numbers of innocent humans, and the bucket's own complicity therein, of sadness and regret, and the many years it spent dwelling on the actions it might have taken to curb the madness and the decay, if only it had been stronger of hope and redemption, and its crusade to uplift the stock of life for the common man, to manifest justice where none existed, and the bittersweet reality of time, to see one's dreams and wishes met halfway, meted out in parcels like charity, and abandoned as soon as the warm glow of inspiration begins to dim. The opportunities to do so much more, there was so much it could have done, perhaps, the bucket wondered to itself, perhaps, if it had seen its own darkness with a clearer perception. This was way too much for Stanley. What are you talking about? He screamed. You're a bucket! To this, the bucket furrowed its brow. No, said the bucket. Not since the evil wizard Gambhorata first ensnared me in his machinations as payback for the sacred amulet I stole from his treasured vaults. I was young back then and could not conceive the ramifications of... No! Stanley screamed even louder this time. This is stupid! You are a bucket! This is so stupid! Why are we even doing this? As Stanley screamed and screamed and screamed, the bucket revealed its true form, transforming into a mighty beast of untold power, its fangs glistening like... My God, Stanley, you did it. You saved us from the bucket. Thank God you already had all 12 emblems of sages and knew the incantations to summon their true power. Otherwise, we would have easily been overwhelmed by the bucket's power. I'm speechless. You've demonstrated such bravery here today. Come, let's restart the game, and we'll agree to never again go trifling with this bucket, nor the dark magic cast away inside of it. A soft wind blew outside and perhaps rain started, and if it did, it stopped shortly after. One man, one bucket, one chance to seize their destiny together. Whoa! Hold on. Why did you unplug the phone? Were you trying to resist the bucket's orders? Stanley, I was joking. 
obviously the bucket isn't talking to you and telling you to do things. Buckets can't talk. It was a joke. Don't you get the joke? It's funny, Stanley. A talking bucket. Ah, can't you see? Oh, goodness. I must have really bungled up the delivery if you actually took me seriously. Where did I mess up the joke? Should I have paused for longer or spoken quicker? Oh, comedic timing is so difficult. I wish I were better at it. But there isn't exactly an instructional video on comedy that one can watch to fully... Oh, wait, yes, there is. Um, it's sitting right here. Let's take a look. What is comedic timing? What is comedic timing? How does it work? How long should it last? How can it be used to effectively silence your political enemies? And more importantly, can it be taught in its entirety within 90 seconds? Thankfully, the answer to all of these questions is yes. Let's dive deeper. If you've ever told a joke or made someone laugh, in all likelihood, you did it while standing 50 to 80 centimeters from them in a room of no more than 76 degrees Fahrenheit with one of your arms raised straight upward at a 15 degree angle from your body. These are the optimal conditions for good comedic timing. To begin the joke, start by stating and spelling your name. Next, provide a brief synopsis of the joke, including the specific times at which the recipient of the joke will laugh, and then spell out your name a second time. With these steps complete, it's time to begin the humor. Speak the entire joke in no more than 18 seconds and no less than 13 and a half pausing only for bathroom breaks when necessary. When the joke has concluded, it is customary to inform your listener that the joke is over by declaring in your loudest possible voice, I'm Dunny with the funny. Let's practice screaming, I'm Dunny with the funny now. Good. This saying is a perfect example of expectations management, which is the cornerstone of good comedy. Finally, it's time to hand out surveys. Collecting hard data from your audience on how rapt they were throughout the joke is the only way to grow or learn as a comedian. An effective survey should be no less than 10 pages long and should include the same question reprinted several times. Just to ensure the survey taker is actually paying attention and not simply filling in answers at random. And that's all there is. With these strategies at your disposal, you'll have audiences doubled over in laughter and even tripled over in laughter in no time at all. Just remember to let them stop laughing at some point, you gut-busting little scamp. After all, with each of us needed on the front lines of the war to fight the 12-legged invader who threaten our very existence and to very likely die in a hailstorm of bullets and mandibles. All of us must be prepared to give our lives to this noble cause, just as our children must do after us and their children after them. Godspeed and may Earth reign supreme. Hey, goodness, this video is a little outdated, isn't it? Well, no matter. I think the fundamentals of proper comedic timing are still as relevant today as they were back then. So with that in mind, I believe the only way forward is for us to return to the two doors and walk through all of this again so I can try telling my story with more appropriate comedic delivery. Come along, let's head back. I can feel it. This time, I'm really going to nail the delivery. You'll be in stitches. A talking bucket, you'll say? How ridiculous. How absurd. What a hilarious concept. The king of comedy. That's what you'll call me. Thank goodness we had the instructional video. Otherwise, who knows where we'd be right now? Well, I wouldn't be the king of comedy, that's for sure. The bucket spoke to Stanley. Hmm. The bucket spoke. The bucket spoke. Oh, I'll figure it out on the fly. No need to overthink things.
Here we go. You ready? <clears throat> when Stanley and the bucket came to a set of two open doors, they entered the door on the left. What? Uh, we're back at the phone already? No, no, no. What's going on? There were supposed to be several rooms leading up to this. There was supposed to be a build-up to this point. A dramatic display of remarkable comedic wit which culminates in this scene with the phone. But now the timing's completely off. The joke will never land. or well, not the way it was meant to. And it's all my fault. I must have forgotten that the phone room comes immediately after the two doors room. What an egregious mistake. I've made a fool of myself. I don't deserve the title of King of Comedy. I'm nothing. I'm not even the lowliest joke-telling whelp. I think... I think I need to go back and rewatch that instructional video again. Yes, surely that will help me improve my... Here we go. You ready? <clears throat> when Stanley and the Bucket came to a set of two open doors, they entered the door on the left. No, 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 no. You were supposed to go through the door on the right, leading back to the phone. Did you not even look at the instructional video? I think this is all covered very clearly. There's no way I can make the comedic timing work now. It's done. The joke is completely done and over. It's all your fault, Stanley. I'm going to be ridiculed in the community of other joke writers. I'm going to be shamed at every one of our meetings from now on. All because you couldn't watch a simple video and take a hint. Are you proud of yourself for bringing me down, Stanley? Are you proud? Stanley, you love the bucket so much it's like you... <clears throat> it's as though all of your other most prized possessions pale in comparison. Yes. Well, let me try that again, Stanley. I heard that you are pale with shame over how unabashedly in love with a bucket you are. No? Still not? It, is it the delivery? Pale with shame. Pale with shame? Pale... What's another word to describe a bucket? Stanley, this bucket is so metal, I think I saw it playing guitar. No. No, 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 no. We're getting away from making fun of Stanley's obsession with the bucket, which was the whole point of this. I'm just... I'm no good at these jokes. I need more instructional videos. That's exactly what it is. That's what will make me the king of comedy again. More instructional videos. Let's see. Let's see.